I'm Betsy DeWitt, president of the Brookline League of Women Voters. And um, today we're discussing the town's budget. There's lots of good information on the town website under Budget Central. And that would include the FY22 budget files, which include several presentations, including an overview generally of the budget, and then a recent presentation of the current budget to the select board. And both of those are, are, are available for anybody who wants to see them. The League is a nonpartisan organization that works to give all voters accurate information to encourage informed discourse and to encourage active participation in government at all levels. Recently, uh, recent, the um, League's programs have been recorded and are available online. Upcoming, we are scheduling presentations with townwide candidates who are up for election on May 4th and also on articles that will be voted by the annual town meeting on May 19th. Today, the subject is the Brookline budget fiscal year 2020. Officially, and I must add award-winning, uh, officially it's called the financial plan and includes the capital improvement plan that will begin on July 1st and will be implemented after it's voted at our annual town meeting. Our speakers are town administrator Mel Kleckner and deputy town administrator Melissa Goff and I have to say from personal experience, both have spent decades preparing financial information and analysis about uh, the town's affairs. So I welcome them to pre review the budget and also specifically we've asked if they can give us impacts from the COVID pandemic and particularly any current update on the benefit or lack thereof that the town might ben benefit from state and federal relief and stimulus fund funding. Uh, we will welcome questions from our viewers. Please use the chat box. We'll check it regularly. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. So uh, at this point, I turn it over to our speakers, Mel and Melissa. And uh, I think it's Melissa. No, anyway, you guys decide who goes first and take off. Sure. Uh, this is Mel Kleckner. It's confusing. Uh, Melissa, fortunately, she doesn't go by the nickname Mel or we'd be in big That's trouble. That's true. <laughs> we're the M&M &M team this morning. And I uh, want to say uh, thanks, uh, Betsy, and to Ernie for uh, inviting us. It really is a timely topic. And I just want to say uh, always happy to be uh, with the league um, and appreciate all the things that you do for uh, local government, for government uh, participation in general, and for democracy, which, you know, is under assault from a whole lot of different angles these days. So uh, I really do um, admire your work. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the town budget for the fiscal year that begins in July. So uh, we call that uh, fiscal 22. It straddles uh, calendar year 21 and 22. Um, and uh, as, uh, as uh, Betsy mentioned, um, we have uh, done previously a, uh, a so-called Budget 101 presentation. I, I would say that was about uh, about two months ago or perhaps about a month and a half ago. And uh, we would encourage everyone uh, to take a look at that. That does not necessarily focus on the any fiscal year budget in particular. It talks about the budget overall and how it's made up in local government and in Brookline in particular, and, and especially with the process of putting it together, the timing and the process. So I would uh, strongly encourage you to, uh, to pursue that, that, uh, that um, presentation, which was also recorded as yours is today. So um, I just wanna mention a couple of things uh, in, in, uh, in uh, introduction. You know, we heard, we had a little chatter about how COVID is, is uh, changing us and, and all, uh, you know, our practices. And uh, I am in the office. I, that's where I tend to work best and, um, even though there's not necessarily a lot of people around, I'm pretty much exclusively in the office. Uh, Melissa is almost exclusively in her home office. And I will tell you that we never, I never feel like, uh, where's Melissa? Because we're in constant, I mean, literally constant uh, contact. Uh, and um, we've been able to really uh, pretty seamlessly uh, keep our town government running and especially in our office running. And, um, and also, uh, you see me today, I've got a sweater and, and jeans on on a Friday. Uh, that's normally not the way I, I roll. I usually am in a, in a coat and tie every day of the week, but COVID really has changed a little bit of our 
priorities and the practical nature of getting dressed up when you come in and there's nobody to see and uh, you know uh, above above your uh, waist I guess so anyway uh, with that I want to say uh, finally um, it, it's very interesting because last year at this time uh, as you all know um, we were just getting figuring out what what the heck uh, is going on in the world and uh, you know what we need to do to protect ourselves and um, we had already presented our budget this was last year and all of a sudden uh, you know around this time um, everything was upended literally upended uh, and we didn't know which way was up and we uh, were very concerned I mean certain whole sectors of our economy just shut down the whole restaurant industry and the hotels and uh, all of the uh, tourism and many businesses. And so um, we were really struggling to how to put our budget together. And as a result, we did put together a budget in the um, in the spring and then really uh, um, waited until the fall to finalize our budget. We always wait until the fall to finalize our budget. But in this case, it was very, uh, very chaotic how we had to just uh, transition. And now here we are a year later uh, where we uh, produced a recovery budget, and we'll talk about that today, and then last week uh, become advised of the very significant um, economic stimulus package that was passed by Congress, which is flowing millions, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars into the economy, including into local state and local government. And so uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but uh, we got to learn a lot more but it is a game changer at this point in time, uh, right when we're sort of in the point of trying to finalize our budget. So uh, last year was tough news. This year is a little better. We'd rather have this kind of news than, than not. So uh, we'll talk about that. So why don't I get into the, uh, the presentation? So we refer to the FY22 budget as a recovery budget. Uh, and that means uh, as you know, what it implies is that we are starting to uh, our, our, some of our revenues are recovering that were hit by the pandemic and we're starting to um, restore funding that we had reduced from the budget last year. And also uh, just starting to uh, put back into operation many of the uh, programs that had to be curtailed or uh, modified. And you know, many of our programs could have, could do, could have been done off, off uh, online, but some cannot. So certainly, the library and the senior center are two uh, services in particular that we, we are trying to recover from. So anyway, this uh, budget balances $366 million of revenue and expenses, and that's what we refer as all in. And that means all of the various funds and obligations of the town. Uh, that overall budget represents about a 4.8% increase over last year, but effectively it's a budget increase of, of around 3% because there's so many uh, fixed costs or, or things that just pass through the budget um, that we, we don't have any control over. So it's really a, about a 3% budget increase um, over last year. Um, this year, we have spent a lot of time revising the so-called town school partnership formula. So part of my job as the town administrator is to put a whole budget together, the whole budget, including schools and every, every uh, really every penny that the town um, is, is budgeting for. And um, I do that and I allocate the funds to the school department based on a traditional formula. We look at revenue and how our revenue has increased or decreased in the prior year. And uh, this year, uh, we've tried to make that a little uh, more simple. And uh, I think we've achieved that. That was a recommendation of the Brookline Fiscal Advisory Committee from last year, BFAC, which we'll talk about more during this presentation. Um, I mentioned that we had a budget in, uh, increase or a budget um, uh, reconciliation, if you will, in, in November, and we increased the school budget significantly at that point. Uh, we, we made a, a significant increase, a supplemental increase in the school budget. That was not taken into consideration when we made the comparison. Uh, so you'll see the budget, school budget is actually decreasing from the initial budget allocation last year, 0. 0.6, but um, their, their budget effectively is going up. Municipal budgets are going up slightly by 0.9%. Um, we are really spending a lot of money on our capital uh, our capital plant, especially the school projects. Uh, and we'll talk about that, but that's representing now 8% of our prior year net revenue. Um, our enterprises, which are our water, sewer, golf, 
So our businesses are going up by 5.3%. And uh, one major um, factor I want to talk about is we are able in this budget to establish a racial equity advancement fund, which was a, a subject of a prior town meeting resolution. And we're going to do uh, be using uh, half a million dollars from the town's um, cannabis mitigation host um, funds. And we're going to talk about that as well. Um, Move on. There we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this is uh, the budget. And these are the categories um, of, of the budget. And if you refer back to that budget 101 presentation, we talk a lot about these various, get dive deep into some of these categories. But by far, the property tax uh, is the largest uh, source of our, uh, of our revenue. Uh, we have local receipts, which are generated locally, uh, state aid. Free cash, which is basically our fund balance from the prior year, which is used to fund one-time expenses, other available funds and enterprises. On the expenditure side, we break the categories up into all municipal departments, the school department, non-departmental, which is a huge part of the budget, which deals with a lot of the uh, uh, fringe benefits and other uh, uh, fixed costs of the town that really can't be allocated to either municipal or school. We have some special appropriations. Our enterprises are covering their cost and then not appropriated. So overall, $366 million of, uh, of money. It's a very significant budget. Here's just a snapshot of the revenues. And you see, uh, I think this, this pie chart shows you the, um, uh, the, the vast uh, se segment of our, of our uh, budget that relates to property tax. You know, we, we complain a bit about property tax because it's limited under Proposition 2.5. But quite frankly, the property tax is a very stable and uh, predictable source of revenue for the town. Uh, so when we get into situations like we're in with the pandemic or other economic recessions, um, the property tax tends to um, buffer us uh, from, from some of these uh, major revenue swings. Uh, so that's the good news there. Um, on the expenditure side, um, you'll see that, that pie chart uh, you see that non-departmental side, uh, uh, that section of 32%. Those are the what we call the budget busters, um, pensions and, and health insurance and things like that. That's growing as a percentage of our budget. And we're going to, you'll, you'll hear more about some of those uh, budget busters. Uh, the other thing I want to say about, could you go back to the Sorry. expenditure um, slide? Yep. The uh, school department budget, you'll see that as a uh, 33%. But um, when the town does sort of a uh, allocation, so in that non-departmental section, for example, a, a good chunk, at least half of those, uh, much of that is allocated to the school department or for school services. So when we do the sort of overall look at the uh, expenses that are associated with school expenses, it's like 60%. And that's where that formula I mentioned, it's, it's, it's allocating about 60% of the town's revenue to, school, to the school department's budget. Um, I talk a lot about the budget as not just being a budget that um, adds up numbers and balances, um, you know, revenues and expenses. It really is a, a, a document, a policy document that the town uh, really identifies what its priorities are in its budget. And so uh, I spent a lot of time when I put my budget together to think about some of these policy issues and initiatives um, and talk about those with the, my, the select board and others. Uh, one of those is financial management and capacity. Last year at this time, uh, we were just finishing up that BFAC uh, pro project, uh, the uh, Brookline Fiscal Advisory Committee project. And uh, it was a very productive and very comprehensive report. And uh, they gave us a few red flags, even though we are a so-called AAA community and we have uh, very strong uh, finances, um, they told us if you want to stay to be a AAA, and there's some great benefits to being a AAA community, um, then you got to you got to pay attention to some things. So we're in this budget um, wanting to make sure that we're meeting those um, recommendations of the BFAC report, which a major one was a meet and exceed a 10% a target of fund balance. So um, we we should be setting aside about 10% of our um, of our revenues as fund balance uh, to be to protect the town and to provide some uh, flexibility and uh, in, in the event that things go wrong. And that's what the bond rating agencies like to see. So 
we're really trying hard to keep uh, to, to get back to that 10% target. Uh, they talked a lot about the budget process. Uh, that was one of the reasons why I pursued the budget 101 uh, presentation because uh, they wanna open up, make the budget process more transparent. Uh, they focused a lot on economic development and growth. Um, when we talked about the property tax and complained about it being limited by two and a half percent, the fact is that economic development and new growth go above that limit. We, that there's no limit to the amount of rep, that new tax revenue we can generate from this new development and growth. So uh, BFAC, I think, observed that and encouraged the town to invest in its ability to do economic development and grow, obviously, in a, in a, in a, um, appropriate way, uh, given the residential character of our community. Uh, and uh, they uh, suggested we invest in a lot more human resources associated with uh, the budget. Uh, you've met Melissa. We have another staff person, uh, Justin Casanova Davis. Um, and that's it. That's the budget staff of the town and me and, and those two. And uh, of course, we get a lot of help from department heads and others, but that's it. And BFAC observed that if we really want to do, um, you know, much more um, sophisticated financial planning and try to try to get away from this uh, year by year approach at the budget, we really need to invest in some of our staff. Unfortunately, we are una unable to do that at this point in time uh, with the budget. Um, I'm going to try to go through these quickly because they are there are a lot, but they're important. And uh, racial equity is uh, certainly at the top of that list. I don't have to tell uh, you all how important and how much of a priority racial equity has become in the community. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, just mention a few things. We are, uh, all departments are going through a very intensive process of establishing racial equity goals. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about um, the work of trying to um, uh, procure our CERT goods and services uh, uh, through um, uh, with minority and women businesses, and uh, we're, we're working on that. And also, um, the, really the big issue in this budget is establishing that racial equity advancement fund, which the town meeting strongly encouraged a few years ago, and we're able to do that in this budget. Really pleased with that. Uh, moving on to the next policy uh, initiative is police reimagining and reform. Uh, sort of goes a little bit with, with the last item about racial equity and um, the uh, two committees uh, that, uh, that were established by the selectmen are, 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 have effectively wrapped up their, their, uh, their reports and have made their um, findings and recommendations to the select board. And we're gonna go through those um, a lot um, over the next several weeks and months. Uh, I also want to uh, remind everybody that we do have a chief of police that's vacant. Uh, currently um, there's a, an acting chief and that's okay for a while. And frankly, I'm not sure we wanna go right out into the search process right at this moment, but uh, we have a chief of police selection process upcoming and uh, the next, I would say six to 12 months. And uh, that's a big issue. And then uh, also funding. Um, uh, all of these recommendations that the police reimagining and reform committees made are gonna cost money uh, and that's fine, but we gotta figure out how to, how to fund those. Uh, moving on, uh, sustainability and climate action, I know very important to a lot of us. Um, we did, um, we do have in the budget full funding for the enhanced uh, sustainability position that uh, the UMass Collins Center report recommended. Uh, and I wanna mention that we're really developing more sustainability experience in other departments. So we, we, we put the sustainability function coordinated in, the, in our planning department but um, sustainability is not limited to that department. And we've been working hard to try to um, acquire that skill in, in other areas, especially in public works, transportation, um, and uh, in, the building, in the building area. And so really pleased that we've been able to do that. Um, Erin Gallantine, who moved up to the commissioner position, replaced uh, her park and open space position with a woman who, who has a, a, a great deal of a sustainability experience. And we certainly are expecting to get that same kind of level of experience when we replace the uh, engineering um, division director that Peter Ditto had previously uh, been in. Human and social services. You know, um, if you asked me last year or maybe two years ago whether this was going to be a focus of the town, I, I probably wouldn't have, have told you it would be. But um, with the pandemic, 
with all the police reimagining and reform and, and, and the social unrest that we've, we've had in our country. And also, uh, I think a renewed uh, partnership and awareness of, of Brookline Housing Authority issues, we're now focused on a lot of human and social service issues in our community. And so uh, we've, we've had to use, and we're, we have been using, we'll continue to use our federal funding to uh, sponsor safety net programs. Um, the, the Brookline Community Foundation has a safety net fund that we've contributed substantially to. These are things for food security, um, you know, basic living expenses and things like that. I mentioned we restored the library and COA programs. To us, that's not just a budget issue. That really provides a network and a fundamental part of our human and social service network. And then we've really got to figure out long-term funding and jurisdiction for this area. You know, uh, it's never been a local government responsibility. Uh, primarily, it's been a federal and state government responsibility. But what are we going to do if no, if they're not doing that? You know, we're left. We're the ones. We're the government level that's left standing, and we've got to figure out, you know, what our role is and how we're going to fund fund these these uh, these expectations. All right, I have finished, and I want to turn it over to Melissa to go over some of the uh, details about some important issues, and then uh, I'll circle back, and then we'll open it up to um, questions and answers. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Um, so I just wanted to uh, provide a little bit of a highlight on, you know, some of the pressures that the budget does face, and that's in the area of our um, our benefit system. So we have, um, you know, our pension uh, funding is increasing by 1.9 million dollars, and so uh, th that's a pretty that's a pretty tough number to swallow, um, given all the other pressures in the town, and also given that our revenues haven't fully recovered from COVID. And um, annually, that is going to be increasing by 7.85%. So that's a, that's a pretty tough number for the town to manage uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, but that will put us on a funding schedule that will have us paid off at uh, fully funded in uh, 2030. And so we're hoping to keep to that schedule. Um, and you know, but this is just something that um, puts a lot of pressure on the town budget. Uh, OPEBs or other post-employment benefits are another. Um, issue in the town in terms of the longer term commitments for health insurance for employees. And so um, we have been trying to annually increase the contribution from the town side. During COVID, we, um, we actually paused that because we, there was so much pressure on the budget. Uh, normally we increase the operating revenue uh, to support OPEBs by $250,000 annually. So we, we paused that for 21 and we are continuing to pause that in fiscal 22. Uh, our CIP is also part of our financial plan, and so we have a CIP that has an investment of $156 million. We have a lot of really good projects in the CIP, um, and we definitely have a lot of um, a lot of need. Uh, so we have um, our school building projects, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, the high school project, the Driscoll School project. Pierce is in the middle of um, the design process. Um, the debt service is uh, continuing for those projects. And so uh, the high school debt service has been incrementally uh, hitting, hitting the taxes and then Driscoll School and Pierce will be following shortly thereafter. Uh, and we have targets for our uh, capital improvement plan uh, to get 6% of prior year net revenue to support the plan. And then if we, we use free cash to try and boost that even further. These are some of the projects that we funded in our capital plan. And so um, we have, you know, I already mentioned the Pierce School. We've got a pretty exciting project um, for the rehabilitation of Washington Street and using that as a complete streets program uh, provides us with a pretty substantial state match. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we've been doing some improvements at Lars, so we're looking to continue that. Uh, we have leases at the temples to support uh, some of the programs at the school department. Um, we have some uh, traffic improvement projects. And then of course, we've got some park and open space projects. And then we've been talking with the fire chief about some much needed improvements that are um, needed at our fire stations, both for um, the environmental concerns around contaminants in the stations, but then also um, recognizing that if we're growing our female fire force, that we would need to uh, have some accommodations uh, in locker rooms and bathroom space for, for those firefighters as well. 
So um, Betsy and I, when we first were um, talking about preparing for this program, um, you know, I, I said to her that one of the things that has been kind of interesting to discuss at the advisory level is that people aren't, um, you know, totally aware of what we have been doing to respond to COVID. Um, this is definitely, you know, uh, a once in a lifetime kind of event. And it is, I'm continually in awe of the way that our departments have really responded and been creative and innovative um, during this period. So, you know, we initially, you know, have been, had been meeting as a team, uh, Mel assembled the COVID task force as a way for us to all coordinate as all of the issues have been changing in terms of reopenings and restrictions and, um, you know, what functions we needed to, you know, convert remotely and, and, just a whole myriad of, of issues. Um, town Hall is open and it re has remained open throughout this entire time. Um, we're just operating a little bit differently. So you've got people that might be remote uh, and then you also have people that have been coming in every day since this began. And so, you know, we were very fortunate in that we already had a pretty good um, system for on online payments and definitely promoting and encouraging people. If you don't need to come to town hall, you can do this remotely, um, you know, trying to support that. Um, I was noting this week that we actually had the one year anniversary of our first remote meeting. Um, and we did that four days after the governor changed the law to allow us to do that. And that is pretty amazing because we were never allowed to meet remotely. So we had virtually zero experience in running a remote meeting. So flipping that quickly, although it was very painful at the beginning, and I'm sure there may have been people that jumped on our first meeting with all the beeping and we, you know, it was a little chaotic at first. Um, but I think if you go to a select board meeting now, it's pretty well run. And that's a testament to the effort of our staff and our IT department really kind of supporting that and Brookline Interactive as well. Um, our Emergency Operations Center has been uh, really supportive of the community during this event as well. I think um, Chief Sullivan really articulated in front of the advisory committee the way that, you know, departments had to kind of change their roles, do their existing roles, and then also work and help the Emergency Operations Center. So you had Mary Ellen um, Norman, who is, you know, school department, and she was also running logistics for the EOC. You had Lee Jackson, who was our recreation director, and she was also doing planning at the EOC. And so, you know, multiple people, multiple hats, um, getting it all done. Uh, the select board also was involved in terms of, you know, helping us as we were responding to all the different changes and getting policy direction from the board as these things were happening. Uh, it also was a good way to provide updates to the community about, you know, what the situation was. Dr. Jett would come and help inform the public about what's going on with this crisis. Uh, and then, you know, not, not to be left uh, unsaid is the, the efforts at the town clerk's office. Pretty impressive, you know, despite all this pressure, they were able to run multiple elections and early voting requirements. And, you know, we're very appreciative of Je Jeff Nunning kind of assisting us. And, um, you know, we thought things went pretty well, so. Uh, the budget impact of COVID is definitely something we are still experiencing. And so we definitely had a lot of reductions on both the town and school side that we are still um, kind of facing and, and trying to, um, to deal with. And so there's definitely a lot of, um, a lot of need town and schools to try and uh, restore. And, and we're hopeful that in the next couple of years that we'll be able to get back to where we were, get back to full strength. Um, but we did have some, some uh, service reductions and some of those um, were necessary because of COVID. Some facilities are not open. Some programs couldn't be run because they weren't allowed. Um, and so we're looking to see, um, to try and bring some of those back into fiscal 22. Uh, we do have some vacant positions that we have um, not funded in 21 and, and continued that into 22. Um, and we understand that that puts a lot of pressure, especially given the, the service demands um, on town departments. And we, we have some reductions in other areas as well um, that we're hopeful we'll be able to restore. And we have our capital improvement pro program that also um, took some reductions as well. So we are not fully recovered. We're definitely anxious to see, um, you know, potential help coming from the federal government and um, 
that's actually the next slide that I have here. So um, we did get initially $5.2 million from the federal government to help us as we were responding. So things like building cleaning, PPE, IT support, um, you know, we, we had, you know, school needs and town needs and, and being able to have this funding to help us respond was, was definitely uh, a relief. Um, we, the school department also had some emergency funding in order to help as they went into this remote learning environment as well. And now we are now just hearing about the American Rescue Act, which is um, estimated somewhere around 34.2. And then there might be some additional funding around our Norfolk County um, participation. And th there's still a lot of mystery around the rules and regulations around this funding. And so we are waiting for more guidance. Um, I think once we have a sense of what the rules are, we'll be convening our town school partnership, which is a um, committee that has representation from both the town and the schools and um, our advisory committee to talk about you know, the strategic ways that we can be using this money. And so we know that the funding will be provided in two chunks uh, in 21 and 22, and that we have until 2024 um, to spend it. So I think we are very, um, anxious to understand what the rules are. And we also are very cautious because we know this funding is likely one time in nature. And so that we would like to make sure that we're being careful that we don't set ourselves up where we are implementing a program that would need to be sustained over the longer term if we don't have the funding to support it. So uh, that is the last slide. Um, Mel, I think has some closing remarks as well. Oh, Mel, you're muted. Mel, you have to unmute yourself. I think Ernie has to, oh, there you go. Ernie. No, 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 that was my fault. That's that's the other thing about COVID. It's a new, the new phrase, you're <laughs> muted. It's like, I, mean, I hear it about 30 <laughs> times a day. Uh, and so, uh, I, no, I was just gonna say uh, that at that last point that Melissa made about the use of the uh, American Rescue Act funds, uh, we have to be extremely careful uh, because, um, First of all, we don't know what the restrictions are. And I, you know, usually government money comes with restrictions. Um, and also uh, that, uh, you know, it's over a two year period. We've got to um, make sure that if we're going to use it to replace our ongoing revenue loss, that we have a plan that that revenue loss will over time be made up. So, because we don't want to fall off a cliff in fiscal 23 or 24, where all of a sudden uh, we've created all these expectations and then we can't fund them because the uh, funding, federal funding is gone. So that was the only point I was gonna make. Happy to um, answer and uh, listen to any of your comments and questions. Okay, now we can do, I don't see, um, all right, there is a question from Janice Kahn about AA, ARP money. Janice, you wanna unmute yourself and speak? I can't see you, there yes, you go. I Yep. Hi. Hi, Betsy. Hi, everyone. So um, my, my question really has to do with the amount of, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, it has to do with, um, I read Ruth Ann Fuller's memo yesterday to the Newton residents and they're getting 65.2 million, 48, and she said 48.1 million is municipal aid to municipalities over 50,000 population, which we certainly are. Um, but she said they are also metropolitan cities or CDBG entitlement communities. I don't know where we fit in that one, but this is the one that really hit me. 17.1 million is going directly to municipalities um, of, you know, in counties where the county government has been abolished. So I feel like once again, you know, Brookline is really sort of being hit by the fact that we are being really super, um, sort of, I don't know, sort of super supportive of Norfolk County. Um, and yet, I, I think we're not going to see our fair, sh what I think is our fair share of this money. And I wonder, I wonder what we can do about, um, about this, what seems to me like an inequity. Sure. Um, Janice, uh, as usual, is right on top of, of these issues. So, uh, Two things that you, you mentioned, and I will answer your question specifically, but uh, we are one of those major metropolitan 
uh, areas or whatever the re whatever that language was. Um, even though we're not a city, we're over population. We're over the population of fifty thousand, and that is a the the um, the threshold for receiving federal community development block grant funds directly. And often, when you're in that um, uh, in that status, um, you uh, federal funds are distributed in that formula, which I will tell you benefits Brookline, uh, Newton, and others tremendously. Uh, using that formula as opposed to just per capita formula that others are, are, are receiving. And I, if you hadn't seen it, I, I should point out that um, the city manager of Chelsea, this friend of mine is very concerned, very upset that their community, which is below that 50,000 level, they're around 40,000, but of, of course, as you know, have been uh, at the epicenter of the, the pandemic and, and uh, you know, have, have a lot of socioeconomic challenges there. Are, are getting a lot less on a, on, a, on a per capita basis because they're not one of these major cities that Brookline happens to be because of our 50,000 population. So I just want to point that out. That's a controversy that's that's a brewing in, uh, around here. Uh, but um, you know, your comment about Norfolk County is right on, Janice. Uh, we're really concerned that um, in this legislation, the federal government is giving money directly to county governments. And um, except for when in Massachusetts, there's no county like in Middlesex County. I, and that money is just being directly flowing to the cities and towns of Middlesex County. But we have to go through the county and the county commission to get our share, to get our share in Norfolk County, which is about 11 and a half million. I've already um, asked our uh, advisory board. There's a county advisory board. Elizabeth Childs is, is, a, is the town's representative on the county advisory board told her very clearly what the town's expectations and is about you know, trying to get that money directly passed through. Uh, she's supportive of that, of course, but ultimately I think that's gonna be a decision of the elected <clears throat> Norfolk County Commission who, uh, you know, as Janice points out, is not somebody we really, um, you, know, you know, Brookline is, is really in the, in the mix there. And I'm just gonna <clears throat> make a follow-up <clears throat> based on my, <clears throat> sorry, history and knowledge. And that is that um, the way these funds are distributed often, I think at the federal level, they try very hard to find what I'm going to call channels that are established as opposed to here's this money, do whether, whatever you like with it. And having said that, the channels often are murky and um, maybe full of all kinds of uh, twists and turns that nobody had anticipated. And therefore, what we really appreciate in the Brookline town government is the knowledge base that can probably, I hope, go through these channels, but also uh, help us be uh, well represented when there are clearly gonna be some negotiations taking place. So um, we, it's, it's good to know that there are mega bucks gonna be available and what we need is to wait a little bit and maybe be patient until we figure out how many bucks and where they can be spent <laughs> or how they can be spent locally. Um, I, I can tell you that Melissa signed up for every webinar uh, you can imagine on uh, <laughs> anything that's talking about American Recovery Act and we're reading everything we can. And if anybody is telling you, that's why I was curious what you're gonna say about the new mayor. If anybody's telling you exactly how these mon monies are gonna be spent or what the regulations are, let me know because I don't, I don't think it's quite out there yet. I don't, I don't think anybody knows yet and I'm sure it'll take a while. Um, but I guess my thought just sort of in general response to the presentation is that we should be feeling um, a level of, I'm not gonna call it comfort exactly, but a, at this to the sense that we have stability at the moment and no major um, crisis that was triggered by the pandemic and cross our fingers and hope that when we get past this, uh, there will be um, all of the good things that we were sort of crossing our fingers about. But <clears throat> my, my wonder is, do we have any detailed information about where, let's say our businesses have uh, either benefited or not um, from a, some of the direct funding that was targeted toward them? Sure. I, well, um, 
I will just let me read what the, the Massachusetts Municipal Association is an organization that the town, all cities and towns belong to, and they help us, uh, you know, figure these things out. And the one thing they said in an article that I that I uh, would like to re read to you is um, uh, these are the purposes of the funds. Um, number one, uh, to replace revenue lost or reduced as a result of the pandemic. So that's the concern we have that we can't. Uh, you know, we got to be careful what we what we replace to fund COVID related costs. Um, so, for example, if we needed to work on uh, more testing or, or work on the vaccination or COVID, uh, you know, related stuff, provide support to aid households and businesses impacted by the crisis. So I think that's specific to your question, Betsy, that there is funding here to support businesses and then um, to fund investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So um, there's certainly a lot of needs in all those areas. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say we're, we're ecstatic. Uh, you know, it's something we, I felt for a long time that um, schools and local governments and state governments couldn't be asked to, uh, to do the things they're doing in this pandemic and, and to try to recover without, without significant funding. So I, I'm pretty pleased uh, that, uh, that we were able to, uh, to get this, it's a good problem. And um, we hope it really does stimulate the economy as intended. So um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but if anybody out there would like to speak, wave your hand at us and we'll unmute you. <laughs> okay, yes, Donna, you have to be, Ernie, you gotta unmute Donna. Yeah, I'm just reading what I sent in the chat, which is congratulations and abundant thanks to Mel Melissa et al. for your quick and effective COVID response on behalf of your beloved Brookline, exclamation point. <laughs> it's not a question. Okay. Thank you, Donna. And I would, I would return the thanks and say, you know, one of the things that's been really great is the way that the community has really kind of responded and and definitely understood and been patient with us as we've been responding to this. Um, you know, town hall has limited hours and people have figured out how to make appointments to get the services that they need and, um, you know, really appreciative of the, of the support. Okay, any other comments? It doesn't have to be a question. It's, you're welcome to comment if you'd like. Okay. Yes, Rose, and uh, we need to unmute you. Yeah, there we go. Speak. If the um, uh, recommendations of the Reimagining Police Task Force comes into play, and I must say, I hope they do not. Um, uh, I, I, the uh, organizational chart that was recommended by them, uh, I don't think is to the advantage of our Brookline seniors. But if it does, there are other brand new um, uh, departments that are going to need to be funded. How is this going to impact on, on dollars and, and a, a appropriation of funds that you're speaking to us today about? Uh, well, it's a great question. And uh, when I was uh, going over the, um, uh, the police reimagining reform, I, uh, you know, the last uh, bullet point was funding and with question marks and, and because uh, we don't have uh, really a plan. I, you know, th there are many good recommendations from both side, both committees, but some of them aren't as, as well developed to, to just figure out exactly what does this mean. Uh, so the select board began last night. They had a meeting, a special meeting for about two and a half hours last night. Uh, and uh, didn't allow anybody else to talk from the public because you know they've been hearing a lot of that for, for good reason, but they just talked it through. And they're gonna do this for, I think, a number of meetings to try to figure out uh, how uh, we can sort of meld the recommendations of these two bodies together and what it's gonna cost and how, what impact there is to the uh, FY22 budget. It's absolutely a work in progress and uh, I couldn't give you any more information than that. So just, uh, sorry, go ahead. I, I just, I wonder if somebody could just help me with some basic terms that were used that I, I'm not familiar with. Um, enterprise expenditures, debt service and debt exclusion. 
Sure, I, I can um, take those on. Yeah. So our enterprise funds are our water and sewer fund and our golf um, fund. And so and an enterprise- I can simplify, Melissa, it's fee-based. Right, fee -based. so enterprise funds operate like a business and that the fees support the services. So um, they, are, they are essentially uh, running those operations with the revenues that they uh, charge users for those services. Um, Debt service are the payments made for um, bonded projects. So uh, when you borrow money for the high school project, the debt service is the payments that you're making usually over a you 25 know, year period um, to support the, the projects. And then debt exclusion. So uh, when there are, we have um, our property tax limit, uh, the property tax goes up two and a half percent plus um, any new growth, which is kind of new value that's added to the tax base. Um, a debt exclusion allows us to raise additional funds to pay for debt service associated with certain projects. So the high school was a project that was voted um, to be covered as a debt exclusion. So the, the levy is raised for the exact amount of the debt service payment. The debt exclusion is often referred to as an override, a tax override, because it is uh, overriding the uh, two and a half percent limit. But it's uh, it's uh, it's only a uh, debt exclusion is only um, taxed when there's debt. Once the debt is over and that project is over, that tax goes away. So it is an override, but different than a general um, override of the tax levy. Okay. Other questions from people. And then I've got a question that might be uh, sort of informational for folks. Um, since I assume there is now a high probability that there will be school starting in September, we hope the way it used to be normally, but I understood that um, as a result of the health issues having to do with COVID, there were some questions raised about whether Brookline schools would meet the safety and health standards uh, air turnover and things like that. So could anybody address whether or not we can, A, have the physical, are the physical facilities ready? Should we be able to have school as we used to in September? Uh, well, um, you, you should certainly refer to the so-called panel four where the school committee has uh, convened there. That's what they do. That's, that's right. how they, they advise the, uh, School committee in the town about that, and they, so I, I couldn't possibly speak to the to the level of their analysis, but I, I would say by and large we believe our schools and the ventilation systems are, are are in good shape and ready to go. I think the issue is just the spacing, you know, is physical spacing and what is safe uh, uh, in terms of uh, distances between folks, and uh, that's something they're dealing with now. I imagine that in September that will be. A lot better, a lot better situation with so many of our uh, of our uh, people being vaccinated. But uh, panel four, uh, you know, Melissa mentioned some of the people in the community that have really uh, come to the come to the fore. That is one of them. They're a group of very highly uh, qualified medical and other professionals who really have dug deep down into the issue around school safety in the pandemic and. Um, um, they, they've uh, opined uh, very prominently uh, on this issue. Well, um, I, part of my question, because I, I remembered this discussion coming up just in building renovations, um, and I wasn't clear whether we had, and maybe this isn't really the topic for this conversation, we'll have to address it in a different way, um, but having schools that meet the guidelines in addition to whatever the spacing is required uh, would certainly become part of the decision-making process. That's, that's kind of- yeah, it, it already you know, is, Betsy, and yeah. I can assure you all, the, all the, the projects, even those that were sort of in the middle of design, I took a step back and made sure that uh, they were getting the COVID uh, sort of review of, of all those issues that, have, that we're dealing with now. Oh, and I notice in the chat, uh, Janice Kahn says Somerville opted out of a hybrid system and stayed remote in order to upgrade the school buildings. So obviously different communities are gonna have different issues that they have to address. Um, but that's all part of this whole COVID 
what do we do now and what are we going to be doing next year and all of the above. Ernie, you have a question or comment? Uh, yes, I have a, a question. Um, well, maybe uh, something that could be expanded upon a little bit. Uh, we as citizens have a role in this budget process. So $330 uh, million uh, is a big number. Um, and the budget process involves uh, what, what, how can we influence the numbers that are there, possibly explaining the role of the uh, um, advisory committee and uh, the select board and our ability to uh, testify before these you know, these uh, organizations and uh, individual departments for that matter. Well, and I would then add all of these items will get voted by town meeting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, Ernie, I, I, I think your, your question is a great one. And it's one that I think that a lot of people thought about including the Brookline Fiscal Advisory Committee last year when uh, you know, they, they tried to talk about opening up the budget process um, and, and, and making it more robust because of the uh, contributions that the community could make. And plus it's their money, so they should, should be aware of what's going on. And as I said, that was one of the reasons why I tried to, you know, we're trying to do some education around that. Um, uh, the budget is daunting and the, you know, it's a big budget and uh, under proposition two and a half era, it's hard to kind of make changes. It's, uh, you know, the budget needs to be balanced. It's, it's, it's hard. and um, the process is, uh, is difficult. There's a lot of hearings going on at the same time. Different boards and committees have different hearings uh, on the same issues or you know, even overlapping. You've got, the, the, you've got at the same time, the budget's being considered. You've got all these Warren articles that are coming at the same time uh, because they're all being taken up at the same town meeting. And so a lot of focus is going on those. Uh, so I'm not going to say it's easy. I, I, I don't have a lot of great answers. Um, there's a lot of public hearings. I think we encourage people to be familiar with it. I would, for the start, if somebody was interested in the budget, I'd say watch that budget 101 and read the executive summary of the, uh, this financial plan that we're presenting. And right. at least that will give you, you know, a, a sense of what's going on and then maybe enable you to participate more. Um, and all these public hearings are available um, Melissa, maybe you can explain a little bit about um, the process and where some of these meetings are being posted and how people can become aware of them. Sure. So once the budget comes out, the budget came out in mid-February, um, that sets off a series of public hearings on the budget. And so we have our uh, advisory committee that meets and has um, public hearings on all the budgets. And then the, at the select board meetings, we have all the departments do their presentations to the board on the aspects of their budgets. And so you know, that's an opportunity for feedback, but I also think that even earlier in the process um, at the board and commission level, I think there's a lot of engagement with department heads by boards and commissions. And, you know, that can also be helpful um, on influencing the budget. So as an example, last night in DPW's meeting uh, in front of the advisory committee, we had members of the Green Space Alliance there, um, you know, advocates for the park system supporting the request of the department head. So I think, you know, the budget, it, it, it's endless. You know, we're, we're always working on the budget. As soon as one year closes, we're reopening another. And, and so um, it, there, there's always kind of an opportunity for feedback, but there are, are the formal cha channels of the hearings, but there are also these informal channels of, you know, boards and commissions. And um, even, I mean, department heads are advocating based on their professional expertise. So, you know, kind of understanding their perspective and what their mission is as well is important. One of the things I will mention, I mentioned the BFAC uh, report again, uh, there was some discussion about participatory budgeting and some communities, some of the cities around us have, have begun to actually go out and engage with the community and, and, and have them decide how money is to be spent. Uh, you know, we would start slow uh, and, and low and probably maybe in a, in, cap, maybe in a capital budget area or something like that, but we're seriously considering uh, uh, some participatory budgeting uh, process, which, you know, probably won't be big to start, but, you know, it, it might uh, get people engaged and excited about being more involved. Well, uh, I think on that note, I'm just going to remind people that, oh, we do have a note in the chat um, from 
perhaps a parent saying we've already invested in the school buildings to ensure they meet high safety standards. So um, my, my, my assumption all along, not being an active parent, was that we had done that, but I feel it's an important thing and it would certainly um, be significant with regard to decisions about opening school in September. Um, having said that, um, unless there's another question or comment, I think I'm going to make a particular request to perhaps Melissa. Um, I know that there is a, we, and we said on, uh, at the beginning that online you can go to the town's um, website and get information about the financial plan. But since I found the section one of this book, which of course weighs a ton and not everybody gets, um, I mean, this, this is the financial plan and it's that thick. Um, but there is a wonderful section one that is a summary. And I wonder, could that be just extracted from the plan and put up on the website so that people have an overview? Absolutely. Uh, it, it's very readable and it's pretty thorough and I, I, I appreciate it and I'm sure other people would as well. And then if you're really obsessed, you can dig deep into all of the details because it's all there. Um, uh, obsessed is probably an unkind word, um, but if you're deeply interested and want to know more, it's all written into the financial plan. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for participating. Um, thank you all for good questions. Thanks for Mel and Melissa for presenting and trying to answer our questions. We really appreciate it. Um, the session, as we said in the beginning, was recorded. Uh, it'll be available through BIG. Um, and the thing that we kind of appreciate through BIG these days is that they are putting together a civic outreach sort of component. Um, and they've also been collecting League of Women Voters recordings that I understand are now going to be, I don't know if they are today, but they will become available in a kind of um, organized portfolio uh, so that you could go to them and look up the um, uh, court recordings that have been made of various um, League of Women Voters um, discussion, as well as all the other kinds of things that BIG is doing. But they are also doing a particular effort to um, encourage civic engagement, which I very much appreciate. So thanks to everybody. Um, we will be scheduling, we haven't got them all set up yet, but we will definitely be scheduling uh, candidate and warrant article discussions coming forward. Um, we traditionally have held one second Friday per month. We're probably gonna do at least two, a second Friday and a, maybe a third or a fourth, depending. Um, and you'll hear from us about that as time passes. So thank you all for being here and good luck and stay safe. And we look forward to the details when all of these, sub, <laughs> all of these programs finally become clear as opposed to obscure. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks to all, bye-bye.